Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello, Patrick. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good, Frank. <laughs> nice to see you now finally face to face. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've, We've been, been chatting all day on Slack. So Yes, yeah, so uh, j just as a note for everybody, so Patrick is the god behind the machine. So it's been behind the scene, putting all this together. And um, I'm just absolutely amazed and impressed about uh, how much work he's been putting together in, in so so quickly. And uh, it's been friendly, it's been tactically behind the scenes. So if anything breaks, he jumps on it and we have plan A, B, and C, and D that doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what ops people do, right? So <laughs> Yes, and, and even more than that. It's like in this period of, uh, um, you know, being on tiptoes and, and, you know, having a plan B and C for coronavirus, this is a great lesson of everything went absolutely smooth. So I'll leave the stage to Patrick talking about DevSecOps. An argument that I don't think we talk a little bit enough. <laughs> so um, I apologize uh, because you know, I'm running behind the scenes. I just wanted to say hi uh, before I introduce actually a recording of my talk. I will be hanging out in, on Slack, uh, but I want to thank the security crew. You know, you, Alyssa, and Ray running this like uh, for you know the whole night i guess uh, so <laughs> yeah, so <I> laid out here. <laughs> yeah and i guess people don't want to see like uh, everything like behind below my eyes so i get a better video recorded so thanks again and yeah uh, you know uh you know see you on slack if you have questions uh, about my talk okay. thank you so much patrick great catching you bye-bye see ya good morning um, and thank you for all being here. I'm joining you from remote uh, because I can't make it uh, to the event. My name is Patrick Dubois, and I'm the Director of DevOps Relations at Snake. And today I'm going to be talking about DevSecOps in the context of trust. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been active in uh, DevOps for about 10 years, um, and I've been there from the very beginning, from, you know, when the word DevOps was started uh, at the first, uh, very first uh, DevOps days. And I saw DevOps expanded into this cultural movement uh, beyond the tools. And with the help of some friends, I even wrote like the DevOps handbook, uh, which bundled many of the stories I've seen all about focused on some were tools, but overall, most of it on culture. And, you know, joining SNCC, I binged what many talks about the word DevSecOps. And it really made me sad uh, watching that many of the discussions were about the tools. And uh, so do we really need all these tools to, you know, do DevSecOps or to understand DevSecOps? Um, and believe me, uh, I'm not here as a tools vendor, but you do have to believe me that it's not about the tools. Uh, so this slide will be the last tool slide. I'm sorry for those. You can still leave the room. I, I won't even see you, so don't worry about it. Um, and I believe, you know, beyond the tools, that we have a bigger issue at hand, which is about trust. Um, you know, uh, 10 years ago, uh, security was already on mind of people during DevOps, but it took us a while as the industry to mature. Uh, and now uh, recently, the bottleneck has moved not between them and ops, but to security. And so, you know, they're late to the party, but, you know, there's still a party going on. So don't worry about it too much. Uh, but we need to get better at learning this trust. Because, you know, this is how I thought about security in the last decade. It's basically security 101 is about like trust no one. Uh, and what's the same thing happened in ops. Like nobody was trusting ops. They couldn't do their job. You know, if some people remember the comic Bastard Operator from Hell, it was about an unreliable person not to be trusted. Uh, you know, that's how Shadow IT got born. You know, people went to the cloud just to evade their people. And, you know, things with security is happening the same. They're looking at creative ways just to go around like company policies. 
So uh, in this slide, I started talking to many of the security folks. And uh, whenever I would bring up the trust issue, they said, yeah, it's all this good. You know, it's all good, but it is trust and verify. So we need to verify. And I do want to believe in their good intentions. And I'm not saying this is about policing the dev and the ops. And I'm hoping there is a better way of working and collaborating than we used to do before of saying no. Uh, while exploring ideas around DevOps, I came across the, you know, the research that Mark Burkis did around promise theory. And uh, it is an interesting model to reason about technology, uh, about the system we're working in, because you know, a lot of DevOps is about system thinking. And uh, you know, the collaboration is something that is very embedded into promise theory. Uh, so everybody in the system is an agent, and you know we make promises to other people in the agent uh, in the system. Sorry, um, and promises should be verifiable. But you know the guarantee is not there that it will be that outcome, and that's pretty much like ops learned that it wasn't about building these perfect architectures that could never fail, uh, but we learned to live with things that fail. We learn to live about security that's not perfect um, and to be more about being resilient and making sure that we can deal with the things that we didn't anticipate. So another part that uh, Mark pointed out is that you know it's easy when you have evidence that something is not uh, secure. Like if we know there's a bug, we know, you know there's an attack vector, then it's easy. We know it's not secure or in which circumstances it's not secure. But you don't always have that evidence. And then it becomes a little bit gray. Like if you don't know if it's secure or you have no evidence, is it secure or isn't it? You can't really tell. And that's many of the situations that we're having right now. And we, we don't need to fool ourselves. The fact that the CI pipeline detects a lot of stuff that is a good thing, but it doesn't really make us feel perfectly secure. It builds upon the confidence with that we don't find issues, but we're not sure there aren't any issues. Uh, so trust goes beyond that. If we want to trust the system, we have to deal with it in a different way. In this presentation uh, that John Osborne did at Monitor Automa, he did like an interesting thought experiment. He asked the audience uh, about what, what, imagine the systems are not changing and you don't change any of the systems. Um, how long will it run fine? Will it run for a day, for two days, for five days if you don't touch them? You know, many people start getting uneasy after a couple of days and it is not unusual because part of what makes a system work is the human and the humans are part of the system we work with the tools so we need to be conscious about that it's not only a tool solution but part of the system is also dealing with the humans and on a relation uh, related note john willis showed in this presentation that you know uh, which environment do you think can respond the best to unknowns? Is it a system that is perfectly structured or very deeply structured? Or is it the one that has many degrees of freedom where the humans can decide? Obviously, it's somewhere in the middle, but it isn't the perfect and hard controlled thing that we want to have. There has to be a way to have the humans to make decisions or things uh, that uh, are harder to decide. And another example of how we, uh, we are dealing all the time with humans is actually the pipeline or the flow itself. You know, a lot of people think it's about getting the software moving, but it's actually about the humans talking around the process. They decide things, they verify things, they look at things, they triage things. So in reality, there is a mixture between tools and having humans at work. And, you know, I hear somebody at the back, you know, even here. I can just so hear it. Trust no one, 
I will still trust no one. This is not something we want to do. And, you know, we can even have separation of duties, you know, going at DevOps speed. It's all about being more transparent about the things you do and to utilize the human factor if the tools can't solve it. And I know that sounds scary, but you've got to believe that humans are part of the solution to deal with issues. So what we are basically doing is building a team. We're building a team across DevSec and Ops. And part of being a good team is having a good fundamental trust. And we're so focused on gaming results on the upper end, you know, the results with tools, like can we fix it? But what we are not doing is building the trust between the teams. And that's what makes a team last. And, um, you know, not trusting people is really costly. You know, we have meeting after meeting after meeting to ask permissions, to decide things together. Uh, sometimes it is very costly to do that. In fact, most of the time it's actually costly because if you don't show the trust that people can decide things, you know, that might show that you have a culture that is not fostering that trust. Uh, uh, looking right for a model on trust, I came across this book, The Thin Book of Trust, and it, it revolves around three parts. Sincerity. Do you walk the walk? Do you walk the talk? Is it, are you reliable? Reliability? Can people depend on you? Are you competent? Competence? Are you competent to do your job and do you really care? You can be sincere, reliable, and competent, but not care. And people see that and they might just not trust you, even though you have all the three other components. And while listening to security folks, uh, it was really interesting once you got beyond their tools discussion, what they want. And basically, it fitted the model perfectly. They wanted to be considered during sprint planning. So just be there on the backlog as something to do. They wanted to make sure that they were on the mind all the time, every feature. So they wanted to have this reliability of the developer thinking about that all the time. They wanted to be the developer more competent. So they, the developer had to learn more security practices and the developer needed to care. And that's easy to say because, you know, security is security's job all the time. So why would the others care? And that's what made it a little bit harder. So what a developer wants from security is they want to know that they're sincere. And you become sincere by understanding that there's more things and priorities than just security and that there's a balance you have to find on the bad log. You also want to be there when they're having issues or when the stories are reviewed. And you know, part of not being there doesn't make you a reliable person because you're not there. And they want to become more competent, the developers, but they want somebody else also to, to teach them and to explain this technical security issue to them that they didn't know existed. And also they care about the system. And you know, more you follow the model, you build it, you run it, like this ownership builds up in the team, and they become also, you know, caring about security as well. And what we're aiming at is that security is a non-blocking thing and it's a self-servicing thing. So you can teach the others to do the things that they need to be doing during their job. During uh, a talk, Zane Lackey gave a good example of how they changed the approach at Etsy. So imagine a sensitive configuration, configuration file. Nobody's normally allowed to touch it unless you have approval from five people. But now also imagine it's 2 a.m. in the morning and there is like a deep problem in production and somebody needs to touch that file. Will you wait for five people to get the approval? Waiting, waiting. So they changed their model by 
saying whenever everybody wanna or somebody wanted to touch the file, it would give a warning. Are you sure you're uh, you want to do this? This will go out to five people if you do this. And people feeling competent and confident to do the change and you know that it needs to be done, they can do their jobs. For people not feeling confident, it will be enough to say, you know, I'm not going to touch this. This is not something I should be doing. Uh, so what they did in the end, they trusted the operator as well, not just the process. Another example is, you know, um, many uh, tools will check vulnerabilities. And, you know, it's all good, but we're actually also relying on humans and tools to report those vulnerabilities. So they are part of our solution. And we want developers to become uh, aware of the issues. So, you know, we notify them uh, during the development process and we allow them to fix the, the problems themselves. You know, this uh, enablement of security giving that to developers is something that really works well. But it's more than just checking the vulnerabilities. The trust of a library has actually happened way before that. There are many things that a developer considers in selecting a library, and it also has to do with the trust model. Now, is this uh, library sincere? So do they follow their own code of conduct? Are they friendly to new people? Are they open to new IDs? Uh, are they reliable? What about issues after releases? How often do they release? Is there a cadence? You know, do other libraries depend on that? Are they competent? So do they have tests? Are there readmes? Is there a change log? Are there like release files? Uh, has it been audited? Is the code well, well written? Like many things to pick up and check the reliability or less, I mean, trusting the library. And then the last one is, does the library still care? Like is the pull request too open too long? Are there too many forks? You know, what about the last commit date? You know, all these kind of things, like how long did it take to fix the security? All the things that show that people care about the library. And there's one thing that is getting in our way is that we generally think about ourselves being more trustworthy than the other things of us. So we need to be aware of that. And one of the reasons that is, is that we judge ourselves by our intentions and other judge ourselves by our behavior. So we have the hypothetical ideal case in mind, but the others are seeing the reality. And that's a lot more complicated. And this process takes time. So all these fear for a kind of aspects, they take time. Uh, but in many cases, a tool can get a good discussion going and you look at the value stream and at the system, and you can discover many things together. So true DevSecOps is when you get beyond the tools and you know you start building the DevSecOps as a team or as a group that really works together, together in cases that you didn't anticipate with the tools or the things that you can detect with that. Uh, on the flip side, we need to be aware that we need to become more trustworthy. So that means we have to do the same things that other people expect from us. And so we have to learn things. We have to be sincere. We have to come to meetings. We have to be you know, understanding, having empathy, all the same thing of becoming trustworthy to somebody else. And here's some homework um, that you can use to, you know, to explore some of these uh, building of trusts. Uh, I want to give a special call out to Agile Conversations, which is the first book I read about uh, digital transformation in the light of having like interpersonal communications or collaborations. Uh, it's about having the hard conversations. When you don't agree, how can we get better at that? How can we say things uh, to improve and encourage others? And it's building upon that trust. Uh, it's not yet out, but it will be published soon. And as a last note, I want to say that, you know, all change is hard. Uh, you know, maybe in 2021, people will say, you know, 
You've tried DevSecOps, it just didn't work. It's so 2020, but you just got to believe and keep going. Uh, and as long as we improve our human skills, we have a chance uh, and it will not just be about the tools. Uh, with this, I want to say thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, you know, if you want to reach out to me, I'm Patrick Dubois on Twitter, uh, or just send me an email. Uh, you know, let me know if this uh, presentation resonated with you, uh, or if you have any questions. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day.